You are now about to listen to The Art of War, translated for competitive Pokemon by Mr. Jamvad. Before we begin, let's clarify a few concepts that are necessary to understand before we get into the work. What exactly is competitive Pokemon? This is a turn-based game where two players assemble a team of six Pokemon and battle to see who's the last one standing. It's like chess, but the pieces change every match. You never know what they will do, and unexpected events may occur during the battle that can decide the winner. The players who create good teams and use them effectively tend to win the most, and those who win the most rise to the top. Another important concept to understand is what a metagame is. In formats where players are constantly battling to improve their rank, something called a metagame develops. Think of the word meta as meaning viewing from above. So a metagame is the above view or the bird's eye view of all the battles players are having. In other words, a metagame is simply noticing what's common amongst the players. The final concept is something called value. A Pokemon battle is all about progress. Whenever a battle starts, both players' Pokemon get a finite amount of health, status, PP, items, and time. These are what we call value. The player that runs out first loses. Progress is a measurement of how much value you're taking versus losing. With each passing turn, players are always losing value. Why? Because they're always losing at least some time. However, one player may be losing more value or losing value at a faster rate than the other. That said, let's get into the art of war for competitive Pokemon players. Chapter 1. Laying Plans Sun Tzu said, The art of war is of vital importance to the state. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence, it is a subject of inquiry which can on no account be neglected. The art of war, then, is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. These are 1. The moral law 2. Heaven 3. Earth 4. The commander 5. Method and discipline Okay, so just now Sun Tzu laid out the foundations of warfare. We're going to repeat them. The moral law The heavens The earth The commander Method and discipline so how do these translate in Pokemon, and what do they fundamentally mean? Let's start with the moral law. The moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler, so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. The moral law represents the purpose, the motivation, the passion, the drive, that burning desire, that fire in your belly, the why, simply put, the moral law is the reason for battle. Why would anyone, with all the dangers of war, put it all on the line? What, and more specifically, who keeps them going? In Pokemon, it's the same. The moral law represents the passion for battle, the thrill a player feels when they go toe-to-toe -to -toe with another person's mind and comes out on top. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat times and seasons. In Pokemon, the heavens signify the uncontrollable or invisible aspects of a Pokemon battle. This is what's commonly referred to as hacks or RNG. Neither player, neither general ever controls the heavens. Think about a battlefield. Both generals have to fight under the same circumstances. Both have to adapt, but neither control whether it's sunny, rainy, snowy, and so Similarly in Pokemon, neither player knows when their move is going to miss, neither player knows whether a move is going to get a secondary effect or not, or whether they're going to get the role they desire or not, but they still have to make that consideration with every move they make. Earth comprises distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. In Pokemon, Earth represents the visible and controllable aspects of a battle. This represents the team and the battlefield. The only thing a player can ever control is the team they use and the moves they click on each turn. The outcome 
or the result of the moves they use is always going to be influenced by two key things, the heavens and the moves the opponent clicks. The conditions of a battlefield are always dependent upon the moves both players select each turn and the heavens. So let's say a player uses Hydro Pump on a fire type Pokemon. Whether or not that move is effective is going to depend on whether it hits and what the opponent chooses to do. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness. The commander in Pokemon represents who a player is offline. Who is the individual behind the screen? Is he easily angered? Does he make a lot of excuses? Is he always anxious and fearful? Is he confident? Is he arrogant? Is he resilient? Is he patient? Is he impatient? These are a part of a player's general state of mind. The state of mind dictates the action because Pokemon is a game of thinking. Critical thinking is the core action in Pokemon. And how critically a person can think depends on his habitual state of mind. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions, the gradations of rank amongst the officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. In Pokemon, Methods has two key components, a player's strategy and a player's tactics. A player's strategy represents his preparation before the battle starts. This would also involve his team, which is a part of the Earth Realm. However, that is the pre-game strategy. There's also an in-the-moment strategy that takes into consideration the things the opponent is doing and the context at hand. The second part are the tactics. These are the moment-to-moment -moment decisions he has to make in order for his strategy to succeed. Discipline represents the actual practice a player puts in. How often does he practice? How often does he reflect on his games? How often does he watch the replays? How often is he applying himself and trusting the process? So to recap, the five constants of war are the moral law, the heavens, the earth, the commander, and methods and discipline. In Pokemon, the moral law represents the reason a player has to continue moving forward and committing to growth in whatever they do, no matter what the game is. Why continue to overcome obstacles even when they want to give up? Heavens represents the RNG or the things that are out of a player's control about the game. Earth represents the teams of both players, all the tools, items, and whatnot as well as the battlefield they create with their actions. The commander represents who a player is offline. Is he patient, impatient? Is he dedicated, is he not? What is he like? What is his state of mind on a regular basis? Methods represent a general strategy a player uses before they enter a game. Tactics represent the short-term actions they do in the moment to ensure that they can pull off their strategy. Discipline represents a player's practice habits. Are they reflecting on their replays? Are they putting in the work required to get the output they want? These five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. Therefore, in your deliberations, when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them be made the basis of comparison. Which of the two sovereigns is imbued with the moral law? Which of the two general has most ability? On which side is discipline most rigorously enforced? Which army is stronger? On which side are officers and men more highly trained? In which army is there greater constancy, both in reward and punishment? By means of these seven considerations, I can forecast victory or defeat. The general that hearkens to my counsel and acts upon it will conquer. Let such a one be retained in command. The general that hearkens not to my counsel nor acts upon it will suffer defeat. Let such a one be dismissed. While heeding the profit of my counsel, avail yourself also of any helpful circumstances over and beyond the ordinary rules. According as circumstances are favorable, 
one should modify one's plans. Here Sun Tzu states that the guidelines he's about to share seem more black and white when written on paper. However, in actual warfare, many of these guidelines are going to seem a bit more gray and rules may be broken dependent on what the opponent chooses to do. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. Hold out bait to entice the enemy. Feign disorder and crush him. If he secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is in superior strength, evade him. If your opponent is of choleric temper, seek to irritate him. Pretend to be weak, that he may grow arrogant. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. Attack him where he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. These military devices leading to victory must not be divulged beforehand. Competitive Pokemon is fundamentally a game of problem solving. A problem can be defined by anything the opponent does in order to take value from your team. A solution can be defined by anything you do in order to prevent or reduce the amount of value taken from your team. Your opponents make decisions that cause your team problems and your job as a combatant is to solve those problems and return problems back to them. Deception in this case represents hidden information. At team preview, you never know completely what the opponent has. You never know their EV spread, you never know their items, you never know anything. So because of that, you have to get data from them by forcing them to make moves and reveal their sets. In doing so, you'll attempt to hide critical information about how you intend to win. This is where deception comes into play according to how Sun Tzu explains it. It's not that you're pretending because Pokemon is different from war in that both players have to wait on each other. It's turn by turn. However, there's a lot of hidden information in Pokemon and so keeping the hidden information or pretending that you're a particular set to lure the opponent in. Remember, Pokemon is a game of anticipation. You can lure the opponent in because they're going to anticipate that your Pokemon will do the thing they've seen in the past and then you surprise them with something that they didn't expect. Now the general who wins a battle makes many calculations in his temple ere the battle is fought. The general who loses a battle makes but few calculations beforehand. Thus, do many calculations lead to victory and few calculations lead to defeat? How much more? No calculations at all. It is by attention to this point that I can foresee who is likely to win or lose. Here Sun Tzu is describing team preview and preparation before the battle starts. At the beginning of each game, you get a chance to see your opponent's team. You get time to prepare a plan, a strategy for what you intend to do to win the game. This is taking into consideration the fact that you don't know what the opponent's moveset is, what their items are, or what their EV spreads are. This is under the assumption that the opponent is using conventional moves, conventional items, conventional EV spreads that you've seen in the past. Now, your plan must take into consideration that that might not be the case. And so each tactic you will use on every turn will consider, hmm, what if the opponent is not what I expect? I have to make a play that keeps that in consideration. That way you don't get surprised in a way that could lose you to battle on one turn. Chapter 2 Waging War When you engage in actual fighting, a victory is long in coming, the men's weapons will grow dull and their ardor will be dampened. If you lay siege to a town, you will exhaust your strength. Again, if the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not be equal to the strain. When your weapons are dull, your ardor dampened your strength exhausted, and your treasure spent, other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity. 
then no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences that must ensue. Thus, though we have heard of stupid haste in war, cleverness has never been associated with long delays. In war, then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. In competitive Pokemon, there are two primary perspectives when it comes to achieving victory. One is to be an unstoppable force. Your team is designed to be so overwhelmingly offensively powerful that no opponent can withstand your blows. The second perspective is to be so defensively sound that no team can break through you. In the most extreme case, these teams are referred to as hyper-offensive teams with no focus on defense. On the other hand, the other extreme represents super or hyper defensive teams, commonly referred to as stall teams. Sun Tzu warns here against focusing too much on what the opponent can do to you and not enough on what you can do to the opponent. It is important to ensure that you're protected, but not so much so that you're not taking advantage of the opportunities to defeat the opponent when they arise. Chapter 3, Attack by Stratagem Hence, to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Here, Sun Tzu seems like he makes an unreasonable or impossible request to win battles without combat. And what it seems is meant by this is not combatless victory, but rather struggleless victory. This also aligns with the chapter being focused on strategy. What Sun Tzu means is to win battles without struggle, which is to emphasize the preparation beforehand. Supreme excellence is to win battles easily, smoothly, if possible, based upon the preparation you had ahead of time. Thus, the highest form of generalship is to balk the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the junction of the enemy's forces. The next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field. And the worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. The rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can be possibly avoided. The preparation of mantlets, movable shelters, and various implementations of war will take up three whole months, and the piling up of mounds over against the walls will take three months more. In Pokemon, this means you should find the path of least resistance when it comes to victory. What that means is finding the opponent's weak points and focusing on that rather than focusing on where he is strong and trying to break through that. The general, unable to control his irritation, will launch his men into the assault like swarming ants with the result that one third of his men are slain while the town still remains untaken. Such are the disastrous effects of a siege. Therefore, a skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting. He captures their cities without laying siege to them. He overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. Here Sun Tzu emphasizes the commander, the equivalent in Pokemon being the player. If a player is frustrated and emotionally riled up, they are likelier to make unsound decisions, especially if they lack strategy. So it's critical to always prepare and utilize a team preview to create the best possible strategy. With his forces intact, he will dispute the mastery of the empire and thus, without losing a man, his triumph will be complete. This is the method of attacking by stratagem. It is the rule in war if our forces are 10 to the enemy's one, surround him. If five to one, attack him. If twice as numerous, to divide our army into two. If equally matched, we can offer battle. If slightly inferior in numbers, we can avoid the enemy. If quite unequal in every way, we can flee from him. Hence, though an obstinate fight may be made by a small force, in the end, it must be captured by the larger force. Here, Sun Tzu provides instructions on how to maneuver tactically based upon the matchup of the armies. In Pokemon, this is going to represent the Pokemon on the field. So depending on the matchup at the time, we're going to have to use one of the three actions, which are attacking, defending, and switching. If the matchup is favorable, it may be most beneficial to attack. 
If the matchup is unfavorable, it may be most beneficial to defend or switch. Now, the general is the bulwark of the state. If the bulwark is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If the bulwark is defective, the state will be weak. There are three ways in which a ruler can bring misfortune upon his army. 1. By commanding the army to advance or to retreat, by being ignorant of the fact that they cannot obey. This is called hobbling the army. 2. By attempting to govern an army in the same way as he administers a kingdom, being ignorant of the conditions which obtain in an army. This causes restlessness in the soldiers' minds. 3. By employing the officers of his army without discrimination, through ignorance of the military principle of adaptation to circumstances, this shakes the confidence of the soldiers. But then the army is restless and distrustful. Trouble is sure to come from the other feudal princes. This is simply bringing anarchy into the army and flinging victory away. Here Sun Tzu emphasizes knowledge. In Pokemon, this looks like being very knowledgeable of what your team can do, but not only what your team can do, but what other Pokemon tend to do within the metagame of choice. Thus, we may know there are five essentials for victory. 1. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. In Pokemon, this represents a player who knows when to take value and when to patiently wait for the information they need to ensure that their victory is guaranteed. 2. He will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. In Pokemon, this is knowing when to make the riskier play versus when to make the quote unquote safer play that guarantees value. If the matchup is significantly better for the opponent, it is highly likely that you will need to take higher risk plays, but it is knowing when to do this. 3. He will win whose army is animated by the same spirit throughout all its ranks. In Pokemon, this means always considering any option for victory that presents itself. Oftentimes players get so locked in on trying to win with either the Pokemon or strategy they built the team around, or by an offensive Pokemon, not realizing there are defensive ways to win a game and offensive ways to win a game. So if there's a case where the opponent cannot break through a particular Pokemon or two Pokemon, that is also a win condition in the same way that finding something the opponent cannot defend against is a win condition. So always ensure that you're considering every option for victory. 4. He will win who prepared himself, waits to take the enemy unprepared. In Pokemon, this simply means being patient and waiting for the opportune time to strike down your opponent. 5. He will win who has military capacity and is not interfered by the sovereign. In Pokemon, this means a player must always think for themselves. Think for themselves based on the situation, even if the play does not work. They must always know why and never just mindlessly click a move simply because they saw someone else do it. Hence the saying, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Chapter 4 Tactical Dispositions Sun Tzu said, The great fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat, and then waited for an opportunity of defeating the enemy. To secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands. But the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. Thus, the good fighter is able to secure himself against defeat, but cannot make certain of defeating the enemy. Hence the saying, one may know how to conquer without being able to do it. In Pokemon, this is comprised of two key factors, strategy and patience. Strategy without patience is a sign of immaturity and patience without strategy is a sign of stupidity. A player must always ensure that their turn-by-turn -turn tactics are moving them or progressing them towards their ultimate objective. And during this process, 
The only thing they can control is ensuring that they're not defeated by the enemy. However, the opportunity to defeat the enemy is presented by the enemy themselves. So you must be patient and wait until that opportunity comes. Security against defeat implies defensive tactics. Ability to defeat the enemy means taking the offensive. Standing on the defensive indicates insufficient strength, attacking a super abundance of strength. The general who is skilled in defense hides in the most secret recesses of the earth. He who is skilled in attack flashes forth from the topmost heights of heaven. Thus on one hand we have the ability to protect ourselves, on the other a victory that is complete. Here Sun Tzu reemphasizes the importance of knowing when to attack and when to defend. Remember, competitive Pokemon is a game of problem solving. Sometimes the way a problem is solved is through offensive tactics, sometimes it's through defensive tactics. It is critical that a player knows which one to use at what time. To see victory only when it's within the kin of the common herd is not the acme of excellence. Neither is the acme of excellence if you fight and conquer and the whole empire says, well done. To lift an autumn hair is no sign of great strength. To see the sun and the moon is no sign of sharp sight. To hear the noise of thunder is no sign of a quick ear. What the ancients called the clever fighter is one who not only wins, but excels in winning with ease. Hence, his victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. He wins his battles by making no mistakes. Making no mistakes is what establishes the certainty for victory. For it means conquering an enemy that is already defeated. Hence, the skillful fighter puts himself into a position which makes defeat impossible and does not miss the opportunity of defeating the enemy. Thus, it is that in war the victorious strategist only seeks battle after victory has been won. Whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and afterwards looks for victory. Again, Sun Tzu emphasizes the importance of strategy or preparation. In Pokemon, this represents the team preview or the game plan at the team preview. It is critical for a player to have some semblance of a game plan before they enter battle. No matter how poorly constructed it is, no matter how unwise it is, no matter how uncertain it is. Having the plan is better than not having a plan, especially when facing an opponent that could have a plan. So the player who clicks a lead, goes into battle without thought, is always gonna be at a disadvantage versus a player who knows how to create a proper strategy. The consummate leader cultivates the moral law and strictly adheres to method and discipline. Thus, it is in his power to control success. Here Sun Tzu emphasizes the control a player has over their destiny. The moral law, remember, represents the why. Why is a person going through all the necessary things to strengthen themselves so they can be a victor in war, given all the risks associated with it? Why? What's the reason? Method and discipline represent the strategies and tactics used, and discipline represents the actual practice put in, the work. What is the work that the player is willing to put in? And so that tied with the moral law leads to success. In respect of military method, we have firstly, measurement. Secondly, estimation of quantity. Thirdly, calculation. Fourthly, balancing of chances. Fifthly, victory. Measurement owes its existence to earth. Estimation of quantity to measurement, calculation to estimation of quantity, balancing of chances to calculation, victory to balancing of chances. A victorious army opposed to a routed one is a pound's weight placed in the scale against a single grain. The onrush of a conquering force is like the bursting of pent up waters into a chasm a thousand fathoms deep. Here Sun Tzu emphasizes the importance of a general's ability to be able to measure the risk versus reward of a tactic, the pro versus con of an action, the profit versus penalty of making a certain move. In Pokemon, this means ensuring that 
all the things out of your control, what the opponent does and RNG are considered before taking an action. What are the pros and cons of me clicking Hydro Pump and it missing? How much am I risking? How much would I lose if the opponent makes this decision instead of the one that I'm expecting him to make? All these must be calculated before a move is made. Chapter 5 Energy Sun Tzu said, The control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men. It is merely a question of dividing up their numbers. Fighting with a large army under your command is no wise different from fighting with a small one. It is merely a question of instituting signs and signals. Here, Sun Tzu emphasizes the universal principle of correspondence. Correspondence says, as above, so below, as below, so above, as without, so within, as within, so without. A battle, fundamentally, is just the accumulation of turns. And so, in order for a player to achieve the outcomes they desire, they need to be able to have good turns. And if they have good turns, they are likelier to have good battles. And if they have good battles, they'll have great long-term success. To ensure that your whole army host may withstand the brunt of the enemy's attack and remain unshaken, this is affected by maneuvers direct and indirect. The impact of your army may be like grindstone dashed against an egg. This is affected by the science of weak points and strong. In all fighting, the direct method may be used for joining battle, but indirect methods will be needed in order to secure a victory. Indirect tactics, effectively applied, are inexhaustible as heaven and earth, unending as the flows of rivers and streams. Like the sun and moon, they end but to begin anew. Like the four seasons, they pass away, return once more. There are not more than five musical notes, yet the combination of these five give rise to more melodies that can ever be heard. There are not more than five primary colors, blue, yellow, red, white, and black, yet in combination they produce more hues than can ever be seen. There are not more than five cardinal tastes, sour, acrid, salt, sweet, bitter, yet combinations of them yield more flavors than can ever be tasted. In battle, there are not more than two methods of attack, the indirect and the direct. Yet those two combinations give rise to an endless series of maneuvers. The direct and indirect lead onto each other in turn. It is like moving in a circle. You never come to the end. Who can exhaust the possibilities of their combination? Pokemon also follows the principles of direct and indirect methods. Direct methods represent moves that take value or HP or items or something of that nature from the opponent, whereas indirect either protects you from losing value or sets up for you to take a lot of value in the future. One may assume all that's required in order to win is to deal as much damage as possible. However, if that's the only focal point, then majority of the time you're going to lose the game before the game even starts. Indirect methods are necessary in order to prevent the opponent from taking value from you and waiting for the opportunity to take a lot of value or deal a lot of damage to the opponent. Sometimes that may look like sacrificing a pawn in order to ensure that you get the setup opportunity that you need. It may look like setting up a certain entry hazard. This may look like continually recovering or protecting to ensure that a certain Pokemon does not take any damage. These indirect methods are used far more often than the direct methods of attack. The onset of troops is like the rush of a torrent, which will even roll stones along its course. The quality of decision is like the well-timed swoop of a falcon, which enables it to strike and destroy its victim. Therefore, the good fighter will be terrible in his onset and prompt in his decision. Energy may be likened to the bending of a crossbow, decision to the releasing of a trigger. Amid the turmoil and tumult of battle, there may be seeming disorder, and yet no real disorder at all. Amid confusion and chaos, your array may be without head or tail, yet it will be proof against defeat. Simulated disorder postulates perfect discipline. Simulated fear postulates courage. 
simulated weakness postulates strength. Hiding order beneath the cloak of disorder is simply a question of subdivision. Concealing courage under a show of timidity presupposes a fund of latent energy. Masking strength with weakness is to be affected by tactical dispositions. Thus, one who is skillful at keeping the enemy on the move maintains deceitful appearances, according to which the enemy will act. He sacrifices something that the enemy may snatch it. By holding out baits, he keeps him on the march. Then, with a body of picked men, he lies in wait for him. Here, Sun Tzu references deception, something he discussed earlier in the book. Remember, deception in Pokemon is founded on hidden information. There are always going to be things we do not know about the opponent's team, and there are going to be things that the opponent does not know about our team. So, based on that, we know that the opponent is going to make assumptions based on the things they faced in the past, or perhaps things they've seen you use in the past. And so, we can use deception to our advantage and feign weakness, as mentioned, and use various indirect tactics in order to get the opponent to give us the opening we need. A clever combatant looks to affect the combined energy and does not require too much from individuals, hence his ability to pick out the right men and utilize combined energy. When he utilizes combined energy, his fighting men become, as it were, like unto rolling logs or stones. For it is the nature of a log or stone to remain motionless on level ground and to move when on a slope. If four cornered to come to a standstill, but if round shaped to go rolling down. Thus, energy developed by good fighting men is as the momentum of a round stone roll down mountains thousands of feet in height. So much on the subject of energy. Here, Sun Tzu discusses the concept of combined energy. This has two facets to it. Combined energy represents the Pokemon chosen before the battle. So the synergy between teammates is a form of combined energy that can be used in battle. But before it's used in battle, it's in its potential form. When it gets into its active form, we think of that as momentum or teamwork. This is where a Pokemon may U-turn Volt Switch, or in double battles, may boost another in order to power them up so that they can pick up crucial KOs they may not have been able to pick up otherwise. In the case of momentum, it can also have a psychological impact, as it may cause the opponent to feel as if they're in a cycle that they can't get out of and they need to do something random or sporadic in order to stop it. This can be very useful for the combatant because it may cause the opponent to stop thinking critically and lead with their emotions. And since critical thinking is the core skill in Pokemon, when that stops, it all goes downhill. Chapter 6 Weak Points and Strong Sun Tzu said, Whoever is first to the field and awaits the coming of the enemy will be fresh for the fight. Whoever is second in the field and has to hasten to battle Again, Sun Tzu warns us against the click first, think later mentality. This is the player who, at team preview, does not look at the opponent's team very well, clicks a lead, or has a dedicated lead, and just clicks buttons and thinks later. This is a very, very primitive way of playing. Supreme excellence is having a strategy, no matter how menial or imperfect, before the game starts and then executing towards that with each turn, which each tactic you do, will arrive exhausted. Therefore, the clever combatant imposes his will on the enemy, but does not allow the enemy's will to be imposed on him. By holding out advantages to him, he can cause the enemy to approach of his own accord, or by inflicting damage, he can make it impossible for the enemy to draw near. If the enemy is taking his ease, he can harass him, if well supplied with food, he can starve him out. If quietly encamped, he can force him to move. Appear at points which the enemy must hasten to defend. March swiftly to places where you are not expected. An army may march great distances without distress if it marches through countries where the enemy is not. You can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you only attack places which are undefended. You can ensure the safety of your defense if you only hold positions that cannot be attacked. Hence, 
That general is skillful in attack, whose opponent does not know where to defend. And he is skillful in defense, whose opponent does not know what to attack. O oh, divine art of subtlety and secrecy, through you we learn to be invisible, through you inaudible, and hence we can hold the enemy's fate in our hands. Again here, Sun Tzu reinforces the importance of preparation or developing a strategy before the game starts. You can only know what your opponent's weak points are if you scan their team in the beginning. You can know what your weak points are or where you're strong against the opponent's team based upon the team preview before going into battle. Why is this important? Because then you'll have more what's called mental RAM or headspace, more room to consider what can happen after this move, what can happen after this turn, rather than being in the moment trying to figure it out. If there's no plan ahead of time, then you will try to figure it out in the moment and the time being used to figure it out in the moment, if that had already been solved in team preview, would have been used to plan further ahead. And so now, if the opponent has already developed a strategy, they can plan further ahead while you're figuring out the current turn, which puts you at a disadvantage. You may advance and be absolutely irresistible if you make for the enemy's weak points. You may retire and be safe from pursuit if your movements are more rapid than those of the enemy. If we wish to fight, the enemy can be forced to an engagement even though he may be sheltered behind a high rampart and a deep ditch. All we need to do is attack some other place that he will be obliged to relieve. If we do not wish to fight, we can prevent the enemy from engaging us though the lines of our encampment be merely traced around the ground. All we need to do is throw something odd and unaccountable his way. By discovering the enemy's dispositions and remaining invisible ourselves, we can keep our forces concentrated while the enemies must be divided. We can form a single united body while the enemy must split up into factions. Hence, there will be a whole pitted against separate parts of a whole, which means that we shall be many to the enemy's few. And if we are able thus to attack an inferior force with a superior one, our opponents will be in dire straits. The spot where we intend to fight must not be made known, for then the enemy will have to prepare against a possible attack at several different points. And as force is thus distributed in many directions, the numbers we shall face at any given point will be proportionately few. For should the enemy strengthen his van, he will weaken his rear. Should he strengthen his rear, he will weaken his van. Should he strengthen his left, he will weaken his right. Should he strengthen his right, he will weaken his left. If he sends reinforcement everywhere, he will everywhere be weak. Numerical weakness comes from having to prepare against possible attacks. Numerical strengths come from compelling our adversary to make these preparations against us. Here Sun Tzu emphasizes the importance of keeping as much information hidden as possible. If it's not necessary to reveal a particular set or all the moves in a particular set, that forces the opponent to play in a way where they have to account for the what ifs. What if the opponent is this set or that set? What if the opponent is this item or that item? What if the opponent has this move or that move? They have to play in a way where they have to keep solutions healthy. So if they're not certain if you're a Swords Dance variant or a Choice Bandit variant or a statusing variant of a certain Pokemon, then they need to ensure that the Pokemon that may be able to deal with each of those are healthy. And so keeping information hidden spreads your opponent thin and limits the amount of options they have. Though the enemy be stronger in numbers, we may prevent him from fighting. Scheme so as to discover his plans and the likelihood of their success. Rouse him and learn the principle of his activity or inactivity. Force him to reveal himself so as to find out his vulnerable spots. Carefully compare the opposing army with your own, so you may know where strength is superabundant and where it is deficient. In making tactical dispositions, the highest pitch you can attain is to conceal them. Conceal your dispositions and you will be safe from the prying of the subtlest spies from the machinations of the wisest brains. How victory may be produced for them out of the enemy's own tactics. That is what the multitude cannot comprehend. All men can see the tactics whereby I conquer, but none can see the strategy out of which victories evolved. 
Do not repeat the tactics which have gained you one victory, but let your methods be regulated by the infinite variety of circumstances. Military tactics are like onto water, for water in its natural course runs away from high places and hastens downwards. So in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. Water shapes its course according to the nature of the ground over which it flows. The soldier works out his victory in relation to the foe whom he is facing. Therefore, just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there are no constant conditions. He who can modify his tactics in relation to his opponent and thereby succeed in winning may be called a heaven-born captain. Here, Sun Tzu reemphasizes the importance of being able to assess matchups at team preview. Is the team matchup good? Do you have the advantage? Is it even? Could it go either way? Does the opponent have a significant advantage? If the opponent has a significant advantage, what does one do? This is where he mentions using subtle tactics. First, you'd find a weak point on the opponent's team that you think may exist. Once you find that, you're going to utilize that Pokemon as often as possible to see what the opponent's reaction, what the opponent's solution to said Pokemon will be. Once you've discovered that, then you must develop new tactics to take advantage of the fact that the opponent is forced to go to that Pokemon whenever your most dangerous Pokemon comes out. Within this dance of indirect and direct methods is where you're going to find the key to victory, if it's possible. Chapter 7 Maneuvering Sun Tzu said, In war, the general receives his commands from the sovereign. Having collected an army and concentrated his forces, he must blend and harmonize the different elements thereof before pitching his camp. After that comes tactical maneuvering than which there is nothing more difficult. The difficulty of tactical maneuvering consists in turning the devious into the direct and misfortune into gain. Maneuvering with an army is advantageous, with an undisciplined multitude most dangerous. Notice here, Sun Tzu makes a distinction between an army and an undisciplined multitude. This speaks to the team in Pokemon. Do you have a team or do you have six individual Pokemon? Is there synergy? Do they work together? This is critical to assess because you may be doing everything correctly, but the team, the army, is an undisciplined multitude. If you set a fully equipped army in March in order to snatch an advantage, the chances are that you will be too late. On the other hand, to detach a flying column for the purpose involves the sacrifice of its baggage and stores. Thus, if you order your men to roll up their buff coats and make forced marches without halting day or night, covering double the usual distance at a stretch, during a hundred li in order to wrest an advantage, the leaders of all your three divisions will fall into the hands of the enemy. The stronger men will be in the front, the jaded ones will fall behind, and on this plan, only one-tenth of your army will reach its destination. If you march 50 li in order to outmaneuver the enemy, you will lose the leader of your first division, and only half your force will reach the goal. If you march 30 li with the same object, two-thirds of your army will arrive. We may take it then that an army without baggage train is lost. Without provisions, it is lost. Without bases of supply, it is lost. Here, Sun Tzu refines a previous point he made. Earlier, he mentioned that a general should strike while the iron is hot. Attack when the opportunities present themselves. However, here, he's mentioning that before the opportunity presents themselves, one should be patient and wait for the opening to be provided by the enemy. If one attacks too quickly or tries to rush to victory for whatever reason, may be impatience or fear, it will likely cost him and provide openings for the enemy to finish him. We cannot enter into alliances until we are acquainted with the designs of our neighbors. We are not fit to lead an army on the march unless we are familiar with the face of the country, its mountains and forests, its pitfalls and precipices, its marshes and swamps. 
we shall be unable to turn natural advantage to account unless we make use of local guides. In war, practice dissimulation and you will succeed. Whether to concentrate or divide your troops must be decided by circumstances. Let your rapidity be of the wind and your compactness that of the forest. In raiding and plundering be like fire, is immovability like a mountain. Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. In Pokemon, knowing the land here means knowing what the opponent's hidden information is. What are the items? Is there anything on the team that could potentially stop you? Have you scouted for that? In the case of the game mechanic, what is the terror type, the Z move, things of those nature? One must ensure that the conditions are ready before going for the finishing blow, if it can be helped. There are times where it will work out. However, one needs to make sure that they do not lose the game if it doesn't. Be patient and wait for the right opening. Gongs and drums, banners and flags are means whereby the ears and eyes of the host may be focused on one particular point. The host thus forming a single united body is impossible either for the brave to advance alone or for the cowardly to retreat alone. This is the art of handling large masses of men. In night fighting then, make much use of signal fires and drums, and in fighting by day, of flags and banners as a means of influencing the ears and eyes of your army. A whole army may be robbed of its spirit. A commander in chief may be robbed of his presence of mind. Now a soldier's spirit is keenest in the morning. By noonday, it has begun to flag, and in the evening, his mind is bent only on returning to camp. A clever general, therefore, avoids an army when its spirit is keen, but attacks it when it is sluggish and inclined to return. This is the art of studying moods. Disciplined and calm, to await the appearance of disorder and hubbub amongst the enemy. This is the art of retaining self-possession. To be near the goal while the enemy is still far from it. To await at ease while the enemy is toiling and struggling. To be well fed while the enemy is famished. This is the art of husbanding one's strength. To refrain from intercepting an enemy whose banners are in perfect order. To refrain from attacking an army drawn up in calm and confident array. This is the art of studying circumstances. It is a military axiom not to advance uphill against the enemy, nor to oppose him when he comes downhill. Do not pursue an enemy who simulates flight. Do not attack soldiers whose temper is keen. Do not swallow bait offered by the enemy. Do not interfere with an enemy that is returning home. When you surround an army, leave an outlet free. Do not press a desperate foe too hard. Such is the art of warfare. Sun Tzu emphasizes the importance of being able to read an opponent's psychological state or state of mind. Are they anxious? Are they worried? Are they arrogant? Do they think they have the edge? Did they just choke away a massive lead? Did they get hacked? Do they feel like they've been unfairly wronged? Did you say something in the chat to rile their anger? All these things impact a player's psychological state. And when a player's psychological state is impacted, their actions and critical thinking are impacted as well. So pay attention to the context. Is this this player's first game in a tournament? Have they ever been in this position before? Are they expected to win? Are they trying to prove themselves? Is their entire team depending on them winning this game? All these things will determine how a player is likely to play based on the pressures on their psyche. Chapter 8 Variation in Tactics Sun Tzu said, In war, the general receives his commands from the sovereign, collects his army, and concentrates his forces. When in difficult country, do not encamp. In country where high roads intersect, join hands with your allies. Do not linger in dangerously isolated positions. In hemmed in positions, you must resort to stratagem. In desperate positions, you must fight. In Pokemon, this means being willing to constantly adapt. An opponent may have caught you off guard with an unexpected set or some RNG may have occurred. Now what? You must adapt. That's always the case. 
It's never what happens. It's always how you respond to it. Always adapt. Adapt, 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 adapt. There are roads which must not be followed. Armies which must not be attacked. Towns which must not be besieged. Positions which must not be contested. Commands of sovereign which must not be obeyed. The general who thoroughly understands the advantages that accompany variation of tactics know how to handle his troops. A general who does not understand these may be well acquainted with the configurations of the country, yet he will not be able to turn his knowledge into practical account. So the student of war, who is unversed in the art of war, of varying his plans, even though he may be acquainted with the five advantages, will fail to make the best use of his men. Hence, in the wise leader's plans, considerations of advantage and disadvantage will be blent together. If our expectations of advantage be tempered in this way, we may succeed in accomplishing the essential part of our schemes. If, on the other hand, in the midst of difficulties, we are always ready to cease an advantage, we may extricate ourselves from misfortune. Here, Sun Tzu emphasizes the importance of looking at both sides of the coin of any tactic. These are the risks and the rewards of each play. What are the risks? What are the rewards? Are the rewards worth the risk? Is there a superior option? Will I lose the game if this doesn't work out? Which is very high risk. Will I win the game if this works out? Which is very high reward. Is this the best of the options? Is there an alternative? All these things need to be considered and assessed before one makes the action. A player may have all the advantages, yet constantly lose. Why? Because they're picking tactics that aren't the best of the options. Those are the only ones they can see or consider, and so they succumb to a superior combatant. The art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him. Not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made our position unassailable. There are five dangerous faults which may affect a general. One, recklessness, which leads to destruction. Recklessness here represents a player who does not consider risk or reward and oftentimes does not have a sound strategy. They go into the game and try to predict, predict, I think the opponent's gonna do this, so I'm gonna do this. I think the opponent's gonna do this, so I'm gonna predict him here. I think the opponent's gonna end. And oftentimes they have very inconsistent results and rarely get to the top rungs of the ladder, if ever. Two, cowardice, which leads to capture. The cowardly player does recognize risk versus reward, but emphasizes the risk far more than they emphasize the reward. So much so that they rarely see opportunities to strike the opponent. They're only focused on how they can protect themselves from the loss. Three, a hasty temper, which can be provoked by insults. A player of this nature often blames RNG and the opponent and the game and everything else for every loss or every problem they have. This is often something that they do offline as these are the faults of the commanders. This is why it's so important to assess who you are outside of the game. Four, a delicacy of honor, which is sensitive to shame. This represents a player whose self image is deeply tied up in the outcomes they produce. These are the guys that will say, I'm a 1700 player, an 1800 level player. I'm a master ball level player. And they tie in their identity with their rank. Where this becomes dangerous is when they go below what they think their self image is. When that occurs, they're very likely to need a break. They're very likely to save or hide replays. They're very likely to make alibis for why they are where they are, not reflecting on the mistakes and learning from them. Five, over solicitude for his men, which exposes him to worry and trouble. This represents a player who doesn't have a clear strategy and clear tactics for how they intend to win. And so this manifests itself in clinging to every Pokemon or clinging to Pokemon they no longer need because they don't know how each Pokemon it's going to progress them towards the victory. So they say, well, I need this Pokemon or this is the Pokemon I build the team around. Not realizing that that may be an awful Pokemon in that matchup. And so it needs to go. These are the five besetting sins of a general. 
ruinous to the conduct of war. When an army is overthrown and its leader slain, the cause will surely be found amongst these five dangerous faults. Let them be the subject of meditation. Chapter 9 The Army on the March Sun Tzu said, We come now to the question of encamping the army and observing signs of the enemy. Pass quickly over mountains and keep in the neighborhood of valleys. Camp in high places facing the sun. Do not climb heights in order to fight. So much for mountain warfare. Again here, Sun Tzu emphasizes the patience principle. Do not fight uphill. If there's a higher probability chance of victory, be patient and wait for the opportunity for that one. If you see an opportunity that appears to be a quicker pathway, but is high risk, be cautious. When an invading force crosses a river in its onward march, do not advance to meet it in midstream. It will be best to let half the enemy get across and then deliver your attack. Humble words and increased preparations are signs that the enemy is about to advance. Violent language and driving forward as if to the attack are signs that he will retreat. If our troops are no more in number than the enemy, that is amply sufficient. It only means that no direct attack can be made. What we can do is simply concentrate all our available strength, keep a close watch on the enemy, and obtain reinforcements. Chapter 10 Terrain Sun Tzu said, We may distinguish six kinds of terrain. 1. Accessible ground. 2. Entangling ground. 3. Temporizing ground. 4. Narrow passes. 5. Precipitous heights. 6. Positions at a great distance from the enemy. The natural formation of a country is a soldier's best ally. But a power of estimating the adversary, of controlling the forces of victory, and of shrewdly calculating difficulties, dangers, and distances constitutes the test of a great general. Again here, Sun Tzu emphasizes the importance of being aware of the matchup. In this case, he's referring more to the matchup in the moment versus the matchup of the teams as a whole. And so, within each turn, you're going to have various situations. Some situations are going to be horrendous, and some situations are going to be extremely advantageous. In each case, a different move will be of your greatest benefit, and it is your job as a combatant to be aware of which ones those are and deploy them at the right time. He who knows these things and in fighting puts his knowledge into practice will win his battles. He who knows them not, nor practices them, Will surely be defeated. If we know that our own men are in a condition to attack, but are unaware that the enemy is not open to attack, we have gone only halfway towards victory. If we know that the enemy is open to attack, but are unaware that our own men are not in a condition to attack, we have gone only halfway towards victory. If we know that the enemy is open to attack, and also know that our men are in a condition to attack, but are unaware that the nature of the ground makes fighting impracticable, we have still gone only halfway towards victory. Hence, the experienced soldier, once in motion, is never bewildered. Once he has broken camp, he is never at a loss. Hence the saying, if you know the enemy and know yourself, your victory will not stand in doubt. If you know heaven and know earth, you may make your victory complete. Remember, heaven signifies RNG and the uncontrollable invisible aspects of the game. And earth signifies the visible, controllable aspects of the game, such as your team. And so, within each turn, a player must consider both. What's out of my control? If I use this move, can it miss? If it misses, what are the consequences? And so here, Sun Tzu encourages the general to always have those in consideration before he deploys a tactic. Chapter 11, The Nine Situations Sun Tzu said, The art of war recognizes nine varieties of ground. One, 
dispersive ground, two, facile ground, three, contentious ground, four, open ground, five, ground of intersecting highways, six, serious ground, seven, difficult ground, eight, hemmed in ground, nine, desperate ground. When a chieftain is fighting in his own territory, it is dispersive ground. When he has penetrated into hostile territory, but to no great distance, this is facile ground. Ground, the possession of which imports great advantage to either side, is contentious ground. Ground on which each side has the liberty of movement is open ground. Ground which forms the key to three contiguous states, so that he who occupies it first has the most of the empire at his command is ground of intersecting highways. When an army has penetrated into the heart of a hostile country, leaving a number of fortified cities in its rear, it is serious ground. Mountain forests, rugged steeps, marshes and fens, all country that is hard to traverse, this is difficult ground. Ground which is reached through narrow gorges and from which we can only retire by torturous paths so that a small number of the enemy would suffice to crush a large body of our men, this is hemmed in ground. Ground on which we can only be saved from destruction by fighting without delay is desperate ground. This aspect doesn't mirror Pokemon one for one, but it does emphasize something important to consider, which are your positions. Again, these are your matchups. You're going to have three basic categories, good, bad, neutral, favorable, unfavorable, neutral. So at every moment, a player must consider what position am I in currently? What position would I want to go into? What are the risks and rewards of trying to maneuver myself in such a position? The skillful tactician may be likened to a Shui Zhang. Now the Shui Zhang is a snake that is found in the Shui Hong mountains. Strike at its head and you will be attacked by its tail. Strike at its tail and you will be attacked by its head. Strike at its middle and you will be attacked by head and tail both. This example is meant to reinforce the importance of adaptation mentioned earlier. This is something a general must incorporate into their play. It's never what happens, it's how you respond to it. Thus. The skillful general conducts his army just as though he were leading a single man, willy-nilly by the hand. It is the business of a general to be quiet and thus ensure secrecy, upright and just, and thus maintain order. By altering his arrangements and changing his plans, he keeps the enemy without definite knowledge. By shifting his camp and taking circuitous routes, he prevents the enemy from anticipating his purpose. Again, Sun Tzu emphasizes the importance of deception or hidden information. This is key because it causes the opponent to not know where to defend exactly. If they don't know what exactly is coming, then they have to be prepared for everything which causes them or forces them to spread themselves thin. We cannot enter into alliance with neighboring princes until we are acquainted with their designs. We are not fit to lead an army on the march unless we are familiar with the face of the country, its mountains and forests, its pitfalls and precipices, its marshes and swamps. We shall be unable to turn natural advantages to account unless we make use of the local guides. Yet another warning against going for the victory too early. It is always wiser to scout and gather information to see what is the terrain going to be like. Does my opponent have some tricky set designed specifically to stop what I'm going to be sweeping with? If I do get stopped, do I lose the battle after that? Is my surprise factor gone? Did I reveal all my information and now I'm at the mercy of the enemy? These are things to consider. Chapter 12 The Attack by Fire Sun Tzu said there are five ways of attacking with fire. The first is to burn the soldiers in their camp. The second is to burn stores. The third is to burn baggage trains. The fourth is to burn arsenal and magazines. The fifth is to hurl dropping fire against the enemy. This is yet another example that does not align one to one with Pokemon. However, there are insights that can be taken from this. There are more or less three ways to win a Pokemon game. 
One is to reduce their HP to zero. Two is to reduce their PP to zero, which effectively causes them to struggle, which also leads to reducing their HP to zero. Then lastly, reducing their time to zero and having the advantage as far as Pokemon is concerned. In order to carry out an attack, we must have means available. Material for raising fire should always be kept in readiness. There's a proper season for making attacks with fire and special days for starting a conflagration. Move not unless you see an advantage. Use not your troops unless there is something to be gained. Fight not unless the position is critical. No ruler should put troops into the field merely to gratify his own spleen. No general should fight a battle simply out of pique. If it is to your advantage, make a forward move. If not, stay where you are. Chapter 13, The Use of Spies. Thus, what enables the wise sovereign and the good general to strike and conquer and achieve things beyond the reach of ordinary men is foreknowledge. Now this foreknowledge cannot be elicited from spirits. It cannot be obtained inductively from experience nor by deductive calculation. Knowledge of the enemy's dispositions can only be obtained from other men. Hence, it is only the enlightened ruler and the wise general who will use the highest intelligence of the army for purposes of spying and thereby achieve great results. Spies are a most important element in water because on them depends an army's ability to move. In the case of Pokemon, spies represent the Pokemon you're going to use to force the opponent to reveal their movesets, to force the opponent to show you what's their check and the counter to this. If I do this, what are they going to do? They force the opponent. They force their hand. This is key. These are your spies. And with that, you can gather the information necessary to know when the appropriate time will be to strike them down.